all quiet on the western front. Not since saving Private Ryan have we seen as intensely dreadful a look at the searing front line of global conflict. Mortal penalties and despicable atrocities are etched into the flesh-covered canvas and burned into the brains of those who eventually lived long enough to speak of it. The soul-shattering realism belies a sense of chaotic purpose, however thin that red line might be. These experiences are not forgotten, and they should not, by the ever-lengthening thread of the passage of time, be ignored. All Quiet on the Western Front is the latest film by director Edward Berger, based upon the novel In the West, Nothing New, by Eric Maria Remarque, himself a veteran of World War I. The story chronicles the journey of several graduating schoolboys and their perilous journey into the life-changing and soul-destroying trenches of the Western military front. Adapted twice to film, in 1930 and 1979, the film takes place in the waning days of the First World War. Paul Baumer and several of his friends are excited to be graduating from school, thus affording them the opportunity to enlist in the military and join the forces fighting abroad. They begin as a naive band of glory seekers, yearning for their chance at greatness. Where they ended up is a humbling and sobering reminder of the cost of war and a virtual checklist of man's inhumanity to man. A haunting film that doesn't shy away from images of the inescapable horror of war. It portrays these young boys as soldiers, not as Germans. There is very little differentiating them from the American forces they oppose. They laugh. They cry. They pray. They bleed the same color red and they die as pitifully and honorably as any other frontline infantry on any given battlefield. The fact that they speak a language foreign to American ears really amounts to little more than a narrative trick, to allow the viewer to absorb the visual and to distance themselves from the concept of appropriation. And I definitely recommend viewing this powerful piece with the original German subtitles. The despairing beauty of bullet-ravaged battlefields, the starkly antiquated difference between night and day, the glow of a single muzzle flash lighting up the darkest of pitch-black nights, the looks on the faces of these boys, so overjoyed a mere week ago, to be joining their fighting brethren on the front line, now quivering and shell-shocked, knee-deep in a mud-lined trench, bailing furiously in a vain attempt to keep the deluge of rainwater at bay, while being constantly pummeled again and again by enemy artillery. I can see you raise your ever-clenched fist, swearing by God that we will beat those krauts, and stick with it, boys, Uncle Sam loves you. But that is not the story being told here. This is not America's story. This is not old glory. This is the war, as told from the perspective of those that were considered less than human by the opposition at that time. This was a time of the invention of the term world war. This was a time before the easily identifiable and fear-inducing Nazi regalia. This is the story of Captain America, only German and real. A wiser man than I once wrote, War is hell? No, war is war, and hell is hell. And I'll tell you why. Because there are no innocent bystanders in hell. An interesting side note, by mere coincidence, I happened to watch both All Quiet on the Western Front and Ty West's newest horror film, Pearl, in the same night. And both take place during the same period of time, 1918, the end of the First World War. Though not related in any way apart from that, this film makes a strange bedfellow companion piece to Pearl, giving us a glimpse of the boys that her husband was fighting overseas. Anywho, there is nothing truly new under the sun here. It's a story that's been told and reiterated hundreds if not thousands of times. But the message bears repeating. And that is that war is not glamorous or glorious oftentimes pitiful and senseless and never without consequences, that the physical manifestation of hatred and uncompromising territoriality causes ripples throughout time, ever expanding and ever connecting us as humans to the one true constant, death. There is, after all, a certain very specific and antithetical definition of quiet which exists in this time and place, a place that is the exact opposite of the word quiet. It is among the bombs bursting intermittently. It surrounds the bullets screeching interminably, 
It is above and beneath the injured, moaning incessantly, and all around the soldiers who lay dying. It is instead of the sound of sirens wailing in the not-too-distant air. It is the spaces between all of that, fleeting though they are. It is the minute moments of absence from those things. Those are the moments when you can hear yourself breathe. And it is that silence that sometimes speaks the loudest. It has as much in common with Stanley Kubrick's full metal jacket as with Private Ryan, with its jarringly dissonant score and visually lush framing. As in those films, we observe war through the eyes of both the uninitiated and the weary. The harsh tone of death's ever-clanging knell is never more than five boot prints away, and yet, in the middle of chaos, in the face of mortal savagery arises the human spirit in the form of camaraderie and merciful humanity. To be sure, this is exhilarating visual spectacle in its most gripping iteration, but the heart that beats at the center of this devastating glimpse inside the dogs of war is the notion that wars do not make one great. And so, at the eleventh hour, on the eleventh day of the eleventh month, in the year 1918, the armistice was enacted. The bells were rung, the ceasefire was called, and the First Great World War was ended. But how many men, how many boys, died in those last few hours? How many overall? How many more succumbed to their wounds, even as the cheers were heard and the celebrations had already begun? How many physically survived but left their soul or sanity on the blood-soaked battlefields of a foreign land? Was it too many? Was it just enough? Have we even learned anything from the devastation, ap apart from crunching numbers to strategically discern a way to cause even more destruction and pain the next time around? I hope so, and films like this remind me why that's important.